What up, y'all? And uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Aaron Washington, and welcome to my channel, The Black Trumpeter. And today, for today's masterclass, I'm going to be talking about lyrical etudes and why they're so important, uh, especially in your development uh, as a trumpet player and your development, um, you know, on the sound, um, really increasing the sound, uh, your efficiency, and in, in increasing your um, your ability to have a good tone. So I didn't have any submissions to, today for this master class. So what I'm going to do is kind of practice in front of you guys and kind of go throughout my thought process of how I work on Lyrical A2. So if you have any questions, man, uh, just let, them know, let me know in the comments and I'll make sure that I try to answer answer your questions as best as possible. Um, but for right now, I'm working on, I've been, for this past couple of days, I've been working on, okay, lost connection. But I was just saying, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, work on kind of this lyrical etude uh, from the Conconi book. This Conconi book. I haven't practiced out of it in years, uh, kind of since I graduated from a undergrad. So I'm gonna be practicing out of this book. If you have any questions, just let me know. Kind of, I'm gonna kind of go over like the three things that Three reasons why you should be practicing uh, lyrical etudes. As well. All right. So I'm playing number one of Conconi. What I really want here is to just focus on having a nice full tone uh, throughout the entire uh, etude. Let's see. Show you what I've been working on. So that's it. All right, I think I'm back on. Uh, this connection kind of sucks. So bear with me, guys. Just being able to use your air efficiently. And so with things that move slowly, you gotta really have to take, uh, take your time and, and pace yourself and be able to play things, play each and every note with a nice full sound. Um, something that you really don't have to worry about if the A2 was a lot, a lot, a lot faster and a lot, um, had more uh, shorter note values. Um, but with more Luca A2s, they have longer A2s uh, longer note values, like half notes, whole notes, and stuff like that. So I would say one thing, um, one thing is that it really tests your ability 
to be able to play efficiently, use your air efficiently. With this etude, number one, lyrical etude, uh, it's deceptively difficult, uh, only because it it's in the key of C, right? It's a pretty easy key, but the thing with this etude is that um, is is the dynamics that really makes it uh, makes it kind of difficult because as you ascend, the the dynamics it has you decrescendo. So it's kind of like, while you're going up, you're going down. So one thing that I try to uh, practice and get better at is just first being able to do, hey, what's up, Owen? He says, uh, you're an amazing player. I love your channel. I was wondering how to practice vibrato and how to play high notes with a better tone. Thanks, keep up the great work. Okay. Owen, um, and thank you, thank you for, uh, I, I'm glad that you like the channel, you're loving the channel. Uh, but your question is, uh, how to practice vibrato? Now there's, there's a couple ways, I think two ways that I know of that um, you can practice vibrato. One way is using the hand, and kind of shaking the hand a little bit back, back and forth, like this. shaking your hand back and forth uh, the other way is kind of my preference the other way to practice vibrato is kind of through the jaw kind of uh, using the wah 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 kind of saying wah 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 as you're playing <laughs> Some, so I'm kind of doing that as I'm playing the note and I feel like that's a lot more efficient and you I I have a lot more control over the vibrato if I control it kind of saying that wah, 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 wah. I can control the speed it can be fast or slow it can be fast or slow it can be you know it, you really, for me, you really have uh, lots of control when when you can do it with uh, the jaw. So, but I, I rarely, I, I've never done uh, the vibrato with the hand. For me, it, it, it takes a lot of coordination and kind of it kind of moves the the embouchure a lot. So I try not to do that as much. So one way to practice that is just doing long tones. Uh, maybe doing long tones and see how you can affect the sound. Wah, wah, wah. You're kind of saying that. So I'm kind of like opening and closing. Uh, kind of like my, my aperture, maybe. Let's see. Kind of like moving the jaw, right? So yeah, that's that's how that's how I practice vibrato. Uh, the other question you had: How do you play high notes with a better tone? Um, I would say start playing high notes like really soft. Like you don't have to force out the note to to make sure that it it comes out. Try to try to try to play it as soft as possible while getting a, a sound. So if you're doing your long, if you're doing your scales, try doing your scales and just go up to a G, kind of hold it. notes you you need kind of like three things you need the airspeed the airspeed needs to be fast 
uh, you need uh, the tongue arch, the tongue position needs to be needs to be higher up in the mouth. So in saying E, I kind of covered this in the other uh, master class. By saying E, saying E, you, you have the air, you allow the air to go faster in the mouth because it's more compressed. You know, it's kind of like a nozzle. Like if you close the, if you uh, put your thumb like on the, uh, the hose, the water goes faster. So that's kind of what the, the, uh, the tongue does. So what I did is um, scales, making sure that all the notes sound the same, you know, throughout the register. And I, I did that in conjunction with um, like a, a drone. So like one singular pitch. So say if I was practicing one scale, that C major scale, I will put on um, a concert B flat drone. And I would just practice making sure every note sounded the same, it had the same resonance. It was nice and open and, and full. So that's what I did. So I would do something like this. And also that exercise that I have on my channel. So. That's kind of how I would practice high notes. You know, make sure that all the notes sound the same. Use a scale, you or use a major scale, or use like chromatic scales to really um, because they're they're really small intervals, right? They're really small intervals, so you don't have to worry about big intervals like lip slurs. Um, so I would say work on chromatic scales uh, like Clark Study Number One, and just use that. Uh, as your way to go up the register, uh, you know, stepwise, you know, uh, in an incremental way. So I would, I would suggest you do that. Do some, do some chromatic scales. Make sure all the notes sound the same, and uh, and also make sure try not to force the note. Besides scales, long tones, and lip service, are there any good warm up technique techniques? Thanks for the info. Lucas, what's up? You said sorry I was busy, but I but I'm here. I'm glad you're here, man. Um, get my high register playing um, like increased over the, over the last kind of two years. So um, this is one that you want to start from, kind of like the middle register and try to go down, down like a a, a major triad. So something like this. Um, so start, I would say start on uh, a C sharp and go down the the major triad. So C sharp, A sharp, F sharp. <laughs> and then go down chromatically, um, like descend chromatically, still keeping. Um, you want to finger. Um, the pedal tones the same way that you finger the upper register so pedal f is still going to be one so i'm going to do c sharp a sharp f sharp and then next i'm going to go c a and then f pedal f <laughs> Also, what you can do to help you get down there is kind of glissando, kind of slowly drop the jaw and glissando down to the note that you're aiming for. So like this, for instance. Right? So next, can you play go to... Go tell Bill fast. I don't. I don't know that. Uh, next, uh, go B G sharp E, and you can play uh, pedal E one and two. Uh, 
So you want to make sure that you drop your jaw and say all. And kind of make sure that that you're nice and open and you're really pushing out that air. Uh, not forcefully, but you want to make sure that it's it's coming out. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how I would kind of practice pedal tones. Uh, because for me, pedal tones... It allows me to kind of get the air moving because if you if you stop kind of moving your air, uh, you know you, the note won't come out. He says, "Look, uh, Lucas says, uh, oh, it's because I'm a starter. That's why I, I thought you knew it." Uh, no, I don't. I don't know that song. I don't know that song. I'm, I'm gonna have to look it up later. But hopefully, Owen, that that that's something different. Other than playing long tones, scales, and and uh, other things, I would I would suggest doing some pedal tones, and then after you do that, try to get as low as you can. Because with these pedal tones, you also have to blow pretty fast to get this stuff out to to allow the lips to vibrate. So I'm gonna do uh, starting on B flat, go down the the major uh, E flat try it so b flat g and then pedal uh e flat two and three so hopefully that works what's the hardest song for me for you for me um any song that has tons of uh like large intervals that's a hard song for me but right now uh I'm, I'm working on a lyrical study if you're just joining me i'm working on a lyrical study from the conconi book and it's uh number one it's been a long time since i played out of this book and uh, i kind of want to get to why lyrical studies are so important and uh lyrical studies so the first thing i said was it helps with um, air efficiency, learning how to use your air um, in, a, in a very efficient way, to, to say the least. Um, because the, these are slow tempos, like it's, and it's, it's uh, uh, longer note values. So number two, it tests your ability to play notes in tune. So from note to note, it should sound like it's it's in tune with the note before so for instance um i'll just play i'll just play the first line of this this a2 and i'm going to show you the difference between playing in tune uh from note to note and playing out of tune so i'm going to play uh i want to play one example i want you to tell me if i was playing in tune note to note or out of tune so i'm just going to play a few lines here okay so that's the first one the second second example tell me if it's in tune or out of tune from note to note can you tell me was the second one or the first one more in tune was the second one in tune or was the first one in tune <laughs> he said eric anderson says uh struggling with that out of tune scale first yeah yeah so um that's an example of playing things out of tune right so you for for lyrical etudes you want to make sure that going from note to note it all sounds the same it's um, one one note should not be sharper than the other. It should sound like you're playing a piano, and uh, that's kind of like my goal. Like, picture like you have a keyboard, and all you got to do is press the key, and all those notes will be in tune. Granted, if the tune is 
is if the piano is tuned but I want to make sure that my notes are that in tune from note to note so making sure that uh, you know the tendencies of your horn trumpet play he says look up lucky chops uh, there are the uh, look up Lucky Chops. They are a great band. You rock. Also, what equipment do you use? Trumpet and mouthpiece. Okay, I'll answer that in just a second. So, um, so yeah, if you want to play in tune, just make sure that you know the tendencies, the pitch tendencies of your horn. So, uh, for me, and for a lot of trumpets, uh, uh, D is pretty pretty sharp on the horn. So, you gotta, you know that you have to kick out that third valve tuning slide. Any note that starts with, uh, that does the first valve tuning slide, you kind of have to use uh, the, uh, any note that use the first valve, you have to use the first valve tuning slide because those notes usually are sharp as well. Uh, I know my low A flat is really flat below the staff, so sometimes I have to lip it up. So know your horn. Know if, if certain notes, what, what are the tendencies? Um, which notes are mostly sharp, which notes kind of tend to be flat. And it kind of maybe differs for, for some people dif uh, depending on their horns, but that's one way to, to really be able to play in tune is to really know the tendencies of those notes. But to answer your question, uh, trumpet player, uh, to answer your question, um, what equipment do I use? I play, I play a BNS. I don't know if you can see it. A BNS Challenger 2 as a reverse lead pipe and uh, I love it I love the free blowing that it that it provides uh, before I had a Bach um, the mouthpiece I'm using right now is uh, the Vincent Bach 3C I've had this since um, high school since freshman year of high school and you can tell because it's all beat up so that's the type of equipment that I use. But yeah, so lyrical etudes, you want, uh, it helps you with air efficiency. It also helps with uh, being able to play in tune from note to note. Uh, the third thing I wanna say is it helps with flexibility um, because usually, uh, like for instance, uh, this etude, number one, it has it has it's not just all stepwise motion it has some skips in there with uh bigger intervals so it it helps with that and plus this etude is um is mostly slurred so there's hardly any tonguing involved so that helps with my flexibility as well so for instance this second line i'll play it for you Measure 11 and 12. B -O -O -E -A. Um, that takes a, that that took me a minute to try to get it really nice and smooth. So that's a, only a, a example of kind of the type of flexibility you need in order to make this stuff sound really nice and pretty, right? Um, a tip that that I'll give you to work on that is so here it is in the music. I'll show you. So you see, measure 11 and measure 12. Da, da, dee, da. Right? So if, if, I, if I wanted to play it really nice and smooth, I'm kind of thinking, um, I'm, not, I'm not blowing to each note. So what I mean by that is I'm not directing my air for different notes. So I'm not blowing high and then I'm blowing low and then I'm blowing high. I'm making sure that my airstream is nice and straight throughout and consistent throughout the whole thing. And then what I'm using is my tongue to maneuver to different notes. So this is kind of what I'm, this is what I'm doing. So I'm blank, blowing straight and I'm, I'm using my tongue to anchor certain notes. rather than doing this. Right, 
and so the second time that I did that, um, my the tuning, the tuning from the D to the G, it wasn't quite right. Like it wasn't really in tune. That's because I was blowing from note to note. I was playing as if I was playing. I was trying to play one note at a time. But for this, you want you want to think of notes in a group, right? You don't want to think about individual notes because notes go somewhere. Air is my crutch. I really struggle with that. Uh, Eric, tell me a little bit more about that. What do you mean? You. Uh, let me look at a little bit more uh, comments here. Yeah, Eric, tell me a little bit more about that. What do you mean, air is my uh, air is your crutch? What's uh, what's something that you struggle with? Lucas says, uh, was the trumpet the first instrument you played, or was it another instrument, or was trumpet your first? Um, when I first started, when I first got introduced to um, to playing to to band, I saw a poster that said um, uh, band tryouts. And by this time, um, I'm in sixth grade or going to sixth grade. And I, I never been in a band program. I, I ne uh, there was music, but it was mostly singing. Um, and during that time, I was more into sports. So I played baseball, basketball uh, when I was younger. I did a little bit of karate. <laughs> um, but anyway, I saw that poster and for some reason, I was like, let me try this out. Let me try this band thing out. And so I, I got there and um, I was kind of just immediately attracted to the trumpet just because of the way it looked. Uh, it looks simple and I'm a simple person. So I was like, OK, this instrument looks easy enough. Uh, let me try the trumpet. So I tried it, um, you know, and they, they let you, you know, try to make a sound out of it. So I put it up to my lips and i was able to make a sound he was like great you're you're a natural at it i was like cool if, if i'm a natural at it i'll just pick this then so it was the first and the only instrument that i that i tried out uh when i first got into band only because i thought it was easy and the dude said you know i can make a sound so i just went with it and uh, i've been playing it ever since for what am i 26 so I've been playing for maybe 14 years. Yeah, 14 years. Bruce says, when I've nailed uh, Tune a Day Volume 1, is, is stuff like Arbin too big for my next step? Tune a Day. Let me look that up because I, I don't... Bruce, you're bringing up some good stuff here. Uh, what the Arbin's book is, it's... Um, I feel like it progresses kind of too fast for beginners. So I like, I like to take, for my private students, I like to take out certain exercises um, that, is, that, is, uh, that, that, is, that is at their level. Um, because I feel like the Arbin's book kind of uh, progresses too quickly. So that's, that's where you know, supplement materials comes in handy. So, uh, for instance, like the flexibility studies in uh, the Arvin's book kind of goes really fast, um, really fast in that section. So I, I usually give my students um, uh, this, uh, this book by Laurel Little, and I'm drawing a blank. Um, I think Amateur Builder, that's the name of it. Amateur Builder is, is the one that I, I use for, you know, beginners. Um, for flexibility because it's a nice progression. It's slow. It's not slow, but it's it's a really nice incremental uh, way to to help beginners play go along. Um, so Amateur Builder by Lowell Little, and uh, also um, the 26 or 27 exercises by um, Earl Irons. I love that book. So uh, Amateur Builder and um, in this book by Earl Irons. It's called The Irons Book. Um, so I use those two books for flexibility. It's a nice progression. Um, but yeah, I don't know anything about Tune a Day, Volume 1. I'm going to have to look that up. So thank you for uh, letting me know about that. 
Lucas asks, do you know how to play Star Wars on trumpet? If you can, uh, can you play it, please? Do I know Star Wars? Nah, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even going to even try to attempt it, man. Um, but maybe I'll take some, um, some requests maybe sometime later this year if I learn more. Maybe I'll learn um, more songs for you guys. Uh, Eric says, I blow towards notes more often than not. Hmm. So what I suggest with that is, um, Eric, I, I suggest that you do some, some breathing exercises um, where you kind of blow out for four. So you take in air. So blow, um, breathe in for four and out for four. So like this, three, right? And try to see how long you can blow, blow the air through. Oh, there's a trick. There's a, there's a really nice uh, trick that I learned a couple of days ago. If you get, I, don't, I wish I had a ping ball, ping, a ping uh, pong ball. If you get a ping pong ball, I can't say ping pong for some reason. Uh, get a ping pong ball, and what you do is you try to blow. You you blow through this, and if you blow fast enough, the ping pong ball should stay in place. So that's one way to help get your air moving by blowing at the end of the shank here, and making sure that the ping ball ball, <laughs> the ping pong ball stays in place on the on the uh, mouthpiece so that's one way that's a one trick that um that you can use to to really make sure that you're really blowing some really fast air and then uh use that same feeling and use it on the trumpet use some good questions guys all right so if you're just joining me, I'm, I'm um, kind of practicing in front of you guys. I'm playing the Conconi Lyrical Studies book, uh, A2 number one. And I talked about two points, two points why, why lyrical studies are, are important. Um, the first point was that it helps you with being very efficient with your air. Uh, it also tests your ability to play in tune from note to note because these are longer note values. Um, the, third, the third reason is that, uh, right, it tests your flexibility. Um, and I was just demonstrating that you don't wanna, you don't wanna play note to note. You wanna, you wanna play in a straight line. And I think um, there's a video called The Straight Line Approach um, I forget the dude's name, but that's a great video to watch, the straight line approach. If you wanna um, kind of think about having your air just move forward more. Um, also, uh, with flexibility, when you play lyrical etudes, uh, you wanna, it not only tests your flexibility with slurring, but it also tests your flexibility um, being able to play more expressively. So when I, when I say that, I mean, can you play a high note at a softer dynamic? Um, it, it, it allows you to um, express, to be able to express more either dynamics, articulation, and, um, and also releases, right? So that's another thing, flexibility and how you express the music. Eric Anderson says, uh, any tips on getting your tongue to respond better over time? Do you, what do you mean tongue to respond? Do you mean uh, articulating or you, do you mean slurring and uh, flexibility? Let me know. Lucas says, um, I'm so sad because I have to leave to eat lunch. Well, uh, good man, uh, you gotta eat, you gotta eat. So go ahead and eat. Thanks for stopping by, thanks for watching, man. I, I appreciate your, um, your attendance. And uh, yeah, so that's the third thing, flexibility. Not only flexibility with um, lip slurs, but flexibility in how you express the music, 
right? Um, so articulation, dynamics, and releases. And when I say releases, I mean how you end the note. So it's very important to know how to end the note, right? For it, so for instance, I'll play, uh, I'll play the last line, and and I'll I'll let you hear kind of the difference between a really open release and a really um, abrupt release. All right, Eric. All right, Eric. Thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. All right, so let me play the, the last line. So actually, let me just play the, the first two measures. First two measures, and I'll, I'll end the phrase. Right, so that's one example. Here's another example. First example I did more of a, a open release and the second example was was uh, clipped so I kind of stopped it with my tongue in the first example I stopped it kind of with my air just just allowing my air to fill up the room and just stop blowing but still keeping my oral cavity open whereas the second example I closed it off um, by not, um, by closing the sound off, by shutting my my uh, my aperture closed, and then stopping it with the tone. So, with lyrical lyrical studies, you kind of want to you want to have a, a more open release, to where it 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 sounds more lyrical. I don't know you, any other way to say it. something I need to work on but yeah so a really nice open release he says Lucas I'm gonna stay for a while my parents are getting ready cool child what up Dario from Italy that's awesome so if you guys have any more questions just let me know so let me let me talk about <laughs> that air ball that I just threw in the last uh, the last two measures and so what I what I've kind of concluded was from there's a decrescendo from the G to the C so for me trying to decrescendo and also try to have enough um, air, uh, not air, but like have enough um, momentum to make sure that I have, uh, make, to make sure that I'm playing that lower note. Because for me, when you go to that lower note, you kind of have to open up the aperture a little bit, open up the jaw so you can, you can uh, produce that lower note. But in in con contrary to that you also have to decrescendo and with that i think about kind of a smaller airstream a smaller airstream to make the the note softer uh yeah to make the note quieter so it's kind of like this duality you have you have to drop the jaw all right lucas see you uh you have to drop the jaw but you also have to make sure that you're having a nice and in, in consistent decrescendo at the same time. And that's, that's, for me, that's a little harder to do. Right? How can I be lyrical in a bebop language? Um, that's an interesting question. 
you mean like while you while you're improvising while you're improvising a solo or is it more um when you're playing when you're playing uh the head the the actual melody of the tune uh one way that you can be lyrical with playing a jazz tune is to really pay attention to um articulation and phrasing so in jazz not all notes are created equal so not all notes are important right so knowing where the phrase is knowing where the line is going it will help you um, be a little bit more lyrical uh, if the um, here's some general rules to follow uh, if the line is going up you kind of you you crescendo right so if the line is going down you decrescendo kind of follow the shape of the line um, also with articulation you want to bring out notes that that are syncopated and also uh, the if, if they're the highest note in the phrase and so every other note um, what can I there's an example well I actually like the, there's this there's this phrase that I'm learning um, I'm, I'm learning this um, this Red Garland solo, and there's this line that he plays, and he emphasizes the the upbeat instead of the downbeat, which is I find is pretty hip. Um, let's see, what's the what's the line? Mm. So, right. So he he uh, at the top of the the arpeggio he emphasizes that that um that a. So instead of doing this. Instead of emphasizing the, the downbeat, I'm emphasizing the upbeat. Right? So that's one way to kind of be more lyrical is to make sure that you follow the line and you emphasize um, notes that are syncopated and um, the highest note in the phrase. So those are some tips on that. Hopefully that answers your question. That was a pretty good question. Okay. All right. So the 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 fourth reason I would say to to practice lyrical etudes is is because they're they're a lot more fun than playing long tone exercises or slow scale exercises, right? Because it's actual music. So I always find lyrical studies to be very fun um, because it's different than playing than playing just one note for a long for a long time right so this makes this makes it interesting while working on the same you know aspects of um, getting your tone together right so I would say I would say like sometimes I would play like a few passages like say if I was warming up and I wanted to warm up on like the first four bars of this a2 then I would just do that instead of doing like a uh, chickwood study or um, uh, like a major scale because it has all those things it has all those those elements those fundamental elements like scales and arpeggios already in are already in the music so you're just combining everything you're not only playing music but you're playing fundamentals so I like to think about it like that so what I would do is kind of just Maybe just the first notes of my day would be the kind of the first four bars of this lyrical study. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right? And maybe I'll take that, uh, maybe I'll transpose it into different keys. All right, so uh, let's say if I take it down a half step. Then I'll take 
take it down one more half step. <laughs> I would I would take it down all the way down to F sharp my lowest note and my goal with that is just to make sure that all the notes sound really good like they sound really nice and centered and my airflow is is um, where I want it to be. It's very efficient, and um, everything's working properly. My my valves are working properly. My embouchure isn't all puffed up from the, probably the, the night before. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's that's all I got for you guys. If you have any questions, let me know. And Dario, I'm I'm glad I could answer your question. But um, for these master classes, um, if you guys want me to give you feedback on uh, kind of what you're working on, um, there's there's this master class group that I that I have. It's free to join. Uh, you go to Google. You go to classroom.google.com. Uh, I don't have the information in the description box right now, but if you go to uh, my first two master class uh, recordings. I have the, the information in that description box um, that you can check out and just follow the the information that's that's in that description um, you just enter you go to the website classroom.google.com and you there's a plus sign at the top right of the of the um, the website and you enter in the the code that I have um, provided provided in that description and that way, I, I really enjoy like uh, hearing you guys, uh, seeing what you guys are working on, and being able to give you some some feedback. It's always good to have uh, another set of ears uh, to listen to what you're working on. Bruce, he says, "Been great, man. This is a regular time for you. I'm on UK time. Uh, I believe so. I I, I like this time. Um, like around th for me, I'm in Chicago. I'm in uh, the U.S." And for me, it's it's around 3.30 p.m. And uh, I'm kind of planning on kind of do like an hour, at least 45 minutes to an hour worth of live streaming every Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to see if, just let me know in the comments or let me know in, um, in the stream here if this time is great or should I move to the weekend, maybe a Saturday or maybe a Sunday. Um, but for me, Wednesdays kind of work the best because I'm more free during the week. But yeah. Marino says, thanks, Aaron Greens from Switzerland. You guys are from all over the place. That's that's real cool. That's so cool. Bruce, if these are going to be regular, I'll be here. They as as long as you guys want want them out I'll, I'll um i'll keep producing them these master classes but i really i really wouldn't enjoy you know uh seeing what you guys are working on so i really encourage you guys to record kind of like what you're doing or if you have any questions for me um really record what you're doing so i can give you some nice feedback um because that's one way i would like to help you because I can only do so much <clears throat> if someone's describing their issue, you know, in a comment, I can only do so much, you know, in a comment. Like I, I can't really hear you play. I can't really see you play. So I created this masterclass so I'll be able to, to really um, cater to you guys in, in a better fashion um, rather than giving you tips on something I really, I, I really can't see or hear. So I, I feel like this is another level on how I can help you help you all but uh sam you love it i'm, I'm glad you love it I'm, I'm glad people are loving it um because this this is what i really want to do i love teaching trumpet i love playing the trumpet as you guys know and um uh, and yeah so if there's n no other other questions uh i think i'm gonna call it call it today let me actually let me review 
um, like the three reasons why. Because I think some people are coming in a little bit later, which is cool. Uh, the first reason why you want to practice lyrical etudes is, is it helps you use your air efficiently because of longer note values. The second thing is it helps you be able to play in tune from note to note. Um, get to know the tendencies of your horn. Uh, are notes, uh, which notes tend to be sharp, which, which notes tend to be on the flatter side. So those are things that you need to know in order to play more in tune. The third thing is that uh, it tests your flexibility, not only with lip slurs, but also your flexibility with expressing the music. So um, articulation, dynamics, um, uh, releases, like releasing the note, and also, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, the, the fourth and last thing is that lyrical, ex uh, lyrical studies are just fun to play. They're more fun than playing long tones and or scales and because all of those things are are inside the music uh why not use a lyrical ex a lyrical etude to help you get there at the same time even though you still you need to do your long tones and all all that maybe switch it up and and um and start with the lyrical study rather than a, a long tone but yeah those are my four reasons why lyrical etudes are very important for trumpet players Sam Ward asks, uh, do you hear what you play before you play it? That is an awesome question, Sam. That is an awesome question. And I'm glad you asked that, man. Um, that is so important. If I want to address anything um, in this live stream or in my videos whatsoever, is that singing is the most important thing that you can do for your trouble playing singing being being able to sing what you're to sing what you're playing that's the most important thing that you can do for your trumpet playing because i'm gonna say it again if you can sing it then you can play it those aren't my words but i live those words on a daily basis when i play this instrument and it's not just singing like with your voice but you um but it helps but singing with your mind being able to hear um the notes before you play it because we only have three buttons guys we only have three buttons so where do all the, where do all the other notes come from it comes from here this is this is like vince uh di martino says this is not an instrument what would this this metal thing is not an instrument this is our instrument so the better this instrument is the ba the better we can play this this thing of tubing and metal right so singing yes i i hear i try to hear as much as possible as much as possible everything that i'm playing inside my head um because that helps you with your trumpet playing because if you cannot hear it you will not be able to play it point blank point blank so i'm so glad you asked that question sam because that's so important singing is so important and I don't care if you, you're not the best singer in the world um, because it doesn't matter. It, it matters if, can you, can you a actually just sing the notes here? I need to be able to sing that because it will allow, it'll allow me to ingrain that, that music inside my head. Right? So yes, I try to hear everything, sing every single day. If I don't, if, if that's the one tip I will say to improve your playing is to sing every single day. Sing every day. Okay? All right. I think we got it. All right, so for jazz, he says, or they say, she says, um, they say, how do you properly use the first and third valve tuning slot while playing? That's an excellent question. Um, okay, so like I was saying before, you wanna know the, um, you want to know the tendencies of your horn, right? So for any notes, that use the third valve tuning slide, 
um, then you you then you uh, <laughs> any notes that use the third valve, you want to use the third valve tuning slide. So notes like D below the staff, D below the staff, E flat, first line. Um, I think yeah, D C sharp, C sharp below the staff, one two and three. Uh, one, two, and three is um, is very sharp. So is D below the staff. One, two, uh, one and three, and also two and three. Right. So those are very sharp on the instrument. So you want to use the third valve tuning slide. All right, uh, Hans Holtz, we're gonna get you out of here, bro. All right. All right. So yeah, you want to use uh, the third the third valve tuning slide for at least uh, one, two, and three for C sharp below the staff, D right below the staff, one, two, and three, because these notes are are pretty sharp on the trumpet. Um, so they help you kind of put that note that note in tune, and also E flat. E flat kind of gets a little sharp. It depends on um, the key and what you're playing. But yeah, also use E flat or D sharp. Uh, use the third valve tuning slide with that. Now, now my saddle is. I have to get this fixed because <laughs> my saddle broke off a couple months ago. But I still need to put it back on here. Um, but with anything that that you use the first valve, uh, I keep yeah the first valve for. You want to use the first valve tuning slide. And so if you have a saddle here, you want to be able to move it, of course. Um, so F, first line F, um, second line A, second line A is pretty sharp, F is pretty sharp, and you want to um, pull it out because it lowers the pitch, just like the third valve tuning slide. So F, first line F, second line A, um, also um, third line B flat. Uh, so for instance, so these notes. So you want to use those notes. Uh, you want to use the um, the first valve tuning slide for F, A, B flat, um, D fourth fourth um, fourth line D. That note is usually flat, uh, so I don't use it for D, or uh, I might use it for top line F because that note might be a little sharp. But D, uh, I don't usually use it for because that note tends to be flat. Uh, A, so yeah. So yeah, F, A, B flat, those, those tend to be pretty sharp. So kick out that first valve tuning slide. Uh, for the third valve tuning slide, you wanna play, uh, you wanna play those notes a little bit. Um, th those are usually sharp on the trumpet. So anything that has uh, the third valve, like uh, C sharp, one, two, and three, right below the staff. D, right below the staff. Um, and then um, first line E flat or D sharp. Use that third valve tuning slide. So hopefully I answered your question. So that's how you use the valves. The, that's how you use the tuning slides. For those notes. All right. Any other questions? Okay, Wildcat says, and I get this. I get this question. I don't know why trumpet players like to ask this question. It says, "How how high can you play?" Um, and my answer to that is, however high the music allows. Like, if if I need to play a D above the staff, then that's how high I need to play. Um, <laughs> uh, Reggie, cool Reggie. I'm I'm gl I'm glad you asked that question, man. That was a good question. Uh, yeah, so as far as how how I, how high I can play, uh, I've never really had to play a gig where I had to play a double G like above the staff. Um, usually, most of my most of my gigs I, I play like E's E's and D's like hardly any F's. Um, Cause I don't really play in a big band all that much, but even even um, 
like fourth chair, third chair, second chair, they get they get pretty high notes, um, like C's, D's, E's above the staff. So I would say if you if you want to increase your range to, if you want to know the optimum, you know, place or register to to increase your range, or like a goal, like I would say just aim for, I guess for like right now, just aim for like, for me is like a double G. Like I'm trying to get that double G um, to come out. It's small, but <laughs> I'm, uh, that's that's my goal is to try to get a double G. Um, I'm able to to hit um, C's, D's, and E's pretty 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 good uh, with a nice tone and pretty full. F F sharp. That's that's where I go into fuzzy territory. Um, so I'm working on that, you know, every day. And that and then again, yeah, work on your range with with scales. With that, um, a, a lot of people like the um, that exercise that I have on um, on my YouTube channel. So use that and and do it every day. And I would I would suggest that you do it at the beginning of your routine and not at the end or like when you're very tired because um, you don't want to develop bad habits, right? And you don't want to hurt yourself. So that's why I say um, practice when you're. Um, practice high stuff or you know expanding your range when your uh, when your chops when your embouchure is really fresh never practice range when your chops are really tired because um, you don't want to hurt yourself are there any patterns you use a lot when improvising uh, that's it man you are asking some awesome questions man um, that was from Sam Sam Ward um, I right now I'm working out of uh, I, I'm doing two things. I'm transcribing this solo by Red Garland. He's a piano player, and I'm also kind of working out of this book and trying to figure out like his method of teaching improvisation. And it's called uh, Inside Improvisation by Jerry Berganzi. And there's seven volumes. Right now I have volume one and volume two, and I'm working out of volume one right now. And um, I would say if you're practicing um, improvisation or, or trying to learn like a chord progression, um, and I mentioned this, I mentioned this at another master class, and um, I mentioned this at another master class. I'm getting my, my charger because my phone is about to die. Um, I would say use one, two, three, five on major chords. One. So, yikes. <laughs> so one, two, three, five for major chords, and um, major chords and dominant chords, and one, three, four, five for minor chords, and make sure that minor chord is. Sorry, make sure that minor chord, that minor three, that three is minor. So for instance, if you're doing a two, five, one, and let's do it in C. Um, uh, so D minor, so one, three, four, five. One, three, four, five, to G7, you're gonna use one, two, one, two, three, five. One, two, three, five, to C major. One, two, three, five. So I'm gonna do two, five, one, and C, starting on D minor, G7, and then C major. Uh. Yep, so that's what I would do. And then in, in, uh, in that book, Inside Improvisation by Jerry Briganzi, he, uh, he has different, there's different permutations, different uh, ways to play that, those, uh, those patterns. So, uh, yeah, definitely do patterns um, because they're melodic material. And so it's, it will only increase your, it's, it's kind of like, if you want to equate it to language, I would say like the, that pattern that I played, it's kind of like a word. It's like one word, and uh, the more patterns that you know, 
is like you string them together and they make a sentence, a musical sentence. So yeah, I would say practice four note patterns and practice them, practice them uh, throughout a chord progression. Um, it will not only improve your ear, it will improve your ear training, um, it will uh, also ingrain the it will ingrain the chord progression into your playing because you're able to hear it and you're able to to know the harmonic motion the harmonic um, um, like the harmonic rhythm of how fast the notes the the chords go by right and um, and yeah it also it, it, uh, it, it also gives you some some melodic material to work from so yeah <clears throat> wildcat says i recently transferred to a 3e from a, a 7c mouthpiece excuse me i'm putting in my my charger all right, so Wildcat says, I recently transferred to a, a 3E from a 7C mouthpiece, and my high notes are really sharp on that mouthpiece. Will this go away once I get used to the mouthpiece? Um, yeah, once you, get, once, you get really comfortable with, once you get really comfortable with the mouthpiece or with maybe a new trumpet that you might have, um, the tendencies tend to change depending on the mouthpiece and the in the in the equipment that you use the trumpet um because you you might you cuz you had that 3e you you now you're now trying to figure out you you're doing what you used to do on the 7c in order to get those high notes out and it's transferring over to the 3e and um but it's a lot easier to play those higher notes because of the shallow, shallower cup. Um, so as you play more on the mouthpiece, I would say just open up the oral cavity a little bit more and not be so closed off where it's playing sharp. So for instance, so um, open up, so don't um, make sure that you're, you're your oral cavity isn't closed or you know very small you want to open up so it opens up the sound and it allows the the note to be a little bit um centered and not sharp so i'm going to do an example of a very closed sound to a more open uh, sound so i'm kind of doing like e i'm closing closing off my app um not my aperture but i'm closing off my oral cavity and opening up saying all oh. You have to find um, the optimum spot where it's in tune and it sounds resonant without it sounding really sharp and thin. So you kind of have to play around to see where's the, optim the optimum spot where it sounds the best. And then try to, try to target that spot every time you play that note, right? So do like target, um, I would say like do target exercises where you're just playing one note on a downbeat. So say if you're doing four clicks, one, two, three, four, bop, on, on beat one, play that note and try to get it in tune. And then just like repeat it. So one, right? And then practice that. So maybe if I want to do A flat, Right, so practice, practice making sure that you're you're hitting the center of the pitch by using tar target exercises. But that was a good question. Sam Moore, do you have Facebook so I can send you some of my imp um, improvising so you can give feedback? Um, Sam, I would say um, I don't have the information. Uh, in this live stream, but go to um, my second live stream, number two, and in the description box, 
it will um, give you instructions on this group, the masterclass group, where you can submit your um, what you're working on. Um, it, it's uh, through Google Classroom, so go to classroom.google.com, and then in uh, after this live stream is over, I'm going to put that information in the description box so people can find it. But for now, check out uh, live stream number two or number one and get the code that's that's in the description. So when you enter the code, you're you're able to enroll in the masterclass kind of online group. And that and that's where you can um, upload uh, any submissions that you want me to hear. Is that cool? Awesome. Sight reading tips. Sight reading tips. A um, couple sight reading tips. Um, when you're first looking at a piece of music, these are some things that you need to look at right away. Look at the key signature. Look at the time signature. Look at look at how fast the how fast is it going, like the tempo. Um, try to scan the music to see if there's any. Um, if there's any uh, accidentals, so you want to make sure that you catch those um, catch those accidentals. Also, uh, tip number five, I would say try to look in the music to see what might be the most challenging part. And if you're, especially if you're at an audition and they they're making you sight read, they give you like two minutes to look at it. I would say try to look at the the most difficult passage in that. Um, in that music and and just go through it a little bit but really the most important thing is rhythm because if you can if you at least have the rhythm and you keep going don't stop <laughs> like don't stop when you're sight reading just keep going don't try to um don't try to correct yourself um just keep try to keep a steady tempo and just go so i would say uh look at time signature key signature look at uh, if there's any accidentals, look at any trouble spots that you might have and kind of go over them, especially if it's like a tricky technical lick. Also, um, I would say don't stop. Look ahead. Practice looking ahead to the, the bar, um, like at least one or two bars ahead so you know what's coming up. Uh, don't stop. Keep going. Steady tempo. Kind of really the the most important part is the rhythm. So get the rhythm right. So I would say that sight read every day if you can. Read new music every day to really build your your ability to um, just read read on sight. So those are my tips. Those are my quick tips. Omega MW says hi. What up? What's going on, Sam? Uh, good. So yeah, hopefully check, uh, Sam, check, and everyone else that's watching this live stream, check out the uh, masterclass group that I have set up. Um, I don't have the, the information in this live stream in the description, but I do have the information in my other two live streams that you can check out. All right. Okay, if you're just joining me, please like that video. Uh, there's uh, eight people in here, I got 15 likes. Uh, let's try to get it to 20. Try to bump it up to 20. Um, by liking this video, it's, it, you're able to help me get my content to more people and share this knowledge. Just share the small amount of knowledge that I have uh, to more people. So uh, I want to help as many um, as much uh, as I can. Okay, uh, Mike. Real quick, uh, the the music, the equipment that I use is a Bach 3C mouthpiece. And I have a BNS Challenger 2 reverse lead pipe. That's that's my setup. That's what I use. <laughs> Can I hit some tasty licks for for you guys? Oh, uh, what? Is this? Let's see. Okay, I'm gonna play this lick. I'm gonna try to play some of this. Um, this transcription that I've been working on. And then I gotta go. Let's see, let's see if I can find it real quick. It's um it's off of the album Re Relaxing by Miles Davis. 
and I'm transcribing Red Garland. He's a he's a, a piano player. Red Garland's um, solo. It's uh, from the it's tracks it's track number five. It could happen to you. Let's see. I can't play too much because YouTube will flag me. Okay, uh, let's see. right now I'm, I'm still learning it um but it's in a it, i have to play it low um because he plays it really high but but i'm gonna once i get it to where i i feel comfortable in the lower register i'm gonna bump it up to um a higher register so i can practice um practice it playing playing it in a in the upper register can you do some improv? Nah, I gotta. I'm, I actually have to. I have to let you guys go. It was nice talking to you guys, and I really like doing these live streams. So, if you're interested in getting any like specific feedback from me, uh, make sure that you hit up um, the information uh, that I have in in um, live stream number one and two, and follow the instructions in the description box. I'll put the information in this live stream once this uh, live stream is over and done with. But guys, I'm glad you you are here. I'm glad you uh, you decided to join me for this amount of time. I really appreciate it. Uh, make sure you hit that like button. Let's get this to 20 likes on this video. And this is, Dario says, I have a constellation, but it's very heavy, but uh, versus Yamaha can I be strong with this fantastic trumpet that's all up to you I don't it is it's how you um it's how you use it uh, maybe go to a smaller horn if it's if it's too heavy but that's why I like the BNS because it's not heavy like I don't like a lot of weight all right uh, Omega says I was a bit late but great live video thanks man I appreciate that uh, thank you so much for, uh, I'm glad you're enjoying it. 20 likes achieved. I need like a little achievement.